Hi there, I hope you've enjoyed the start of the PowerShell and DevOps Global Conference Online Edition. Make sure you're following the event hashtag PWSH24. So I'm Josh King and today I'm going to be talking about toast notifications in PowerShell. Uh, this will be a real whirlwind tour uh, with the aim of taking you from noob to master baker. So as I said, I'm Josh King. I'm a sysadmin at Tribe, we're a MSP here in New Zealand, uh, and I'm also a Microsoft MVP. You can find me on Twitter at WindowsNZ, and my blog is toastit.dev. So I guess we'll start with a fairly rudimentary question, which is, what is Toast? Um, and unfortunately, we're not talking about this sort of Toast today. Um, it's uh, down here, it's a wee ways away from breakfast. Uh, no, instead we're talking about these sorts of toast. Uh, most, if not all, modern operating system have, has them. They're little uh, modal UI elements that are meant to display timely and often actionable information to a user. So the examples there, we've got an old Android screen. There's also one there for uh, a Mac. And the one a lot of people here will be familiar with is the one from Windows 10 down the bottom there. Um, there has been a bit of a journey with notifications in Windows. Uh, the first time they really came through as a unified UI element um, was in... Uh, Windows 8. Uh, and in Windows 8.1 specifically, they looked a little something like this. Uh, they would appear up the top right of the screen. Uh, and frankly, I liked the look of them better <laughs> back in the Windows 8 days. Um, so you can see the nice big picture on the left hand side, little icon down there. Um, looks quite nice. Now, everything changed with Windows 10. They're no longer up the top right, they're now down the bottom right. Uh, and they look a little something like this. And unfortunately, they're a little bit blander than um, they otherwise could be. Uh, now that nice big image is down here, it's a lot smaller. Um, if you're using an image like that, you also don't get the app icon anymore, so there's no little PowerShell icon. Um, but they do the job. And there's actually a lot more customization available now as well. So, back in the day, uh, those <laughs> Windows 8 days where uh, all of, well, my journey with Toast started, um, everything was based on templates. So up front, when you were creating your Toast notification, you'd have to choose what sort of Toast you want to display and exactly what you wanted on it. You'd pick your uh, template and then you'd fill in the blanks. So there's quite a list of them, um, but four of the most popular ones I've listed on screen. So of course, you've got straight text, text with a header, um, and then the same again, but with images. Uh, the docs for those old toasts are still available, and I've dropped a link to them uh, on the slide. But now with Windows 10, uh, everything's adaptive. You've got adaptive tiles, you've got adaptive toasts. Um, and now you can have a lot more freedom. There technically is still a, still a template, uh, but it's called Toast Generic. Um, what that allows you to do um, is you're able to now compose your toast however you want. You can be a lot more dynamic with it, changing things on the fly, uh, and you're not bound to what the templates uh, provide. This does give you the freedom to have your toast your way, and because I like making the joke, the way I like my toast is a nice healthy dose of Marmite. So before we look at some actual toast, I wanted to quickly cover the anatomy of toast, what's behind the scenes. Um, and the dirty little secret is it's all XML. If now with the... Uh, generic binding template um, and also back in the days of the old templates it's all XML 
Um, you build up an XML package uh, payload, ship it off to the Windows API, and Windows deals with displaying the resulting toast. So what does it XML look like? Well, here is a example of the default toast notification that we'll be uh, generating in a sec. Um, you can see a number of elements. It's the topmost element is toast, then visual, then binding, and then inside here you can see your template, which is generic, um, the toast generic. Then some toast and image, and notice this is specifically an app logo override. And I'll point out what that means in a second. Um, and there's also some audio, so just the default uh, notification sound. So that XML payload, uh, assuming that that image exists at that path, results in this. So you can see there that text has resulted in the heading across the top, default notification, and the image is this circle cropped thing on the left. A um, little bit diving into the weeds, if you haven't got an app logo override, what you'll see instead is the icon much smaller of the application that generated the toast. So in this case we've shown a picture of some burnt toast, if we didn't do that we would see the Windows PowerShell logo, the little blue one. Um, and also if we'd done that we wouldn't see Windows PowerShell here. So what Windows does now is if you're overriding the app logo, it goes, all right, but the user still needs to know who sent the toast. So if you override the icon, it shows the text. If you don't override the icon, the text doesn't show up there. Um, and you can change what the toast comes from, but that's a little bit outside the scope of today's session. So today I'm going to be using Burnt Toast. It's a PowerShell module that I wrote, um, which means you effectively don't have to worry about any of the XML behind the scenes. Um, and just using native PowerShell, you can go and create your own uh, Toast notifications. Uh, it's available on the gallery, and if they haven't fixed it yet, it'll still show 14 plus million downloads. Um, unfortunately, that's a bit of a bug. Um, it's nowhere near that, um, although it's it, it's a really good screenshot opportunity. So why did I create Burnt Toast? Well, as we've discussed, behind the scenes, notifications or toast notifications are all just XML. You have your XML payload. You send that off to Windows, and Windows then displays a toast notification. You can write those XML payloads by hand or programmatically. Um, and interestingly, this is how um, Burnt Toast worked in its first versions. Uh, and I learned a hell of a lot about XML <laughs> during those early days. But um, frankly, no one wants to be working with XML directly, so hence we use Burnt Toast to um, generate the XML and it handles firing that through to Windows. Now, if you're deploying, if well, if you want to use Toast notifications in a large network, you don't actually have to install Burnt Toast on every machine. You can just use Burnt Toast on your machine to author your XML and then distribute it, the XML um, out across the network. Uh, and there's at toast.click slash no burnt toast. There's an article that I've written about how to achieve that. So, enough talking. Let's get into demos. Um, all of these demos are using the burnt toast module. And if you don't already have it, you can install it from the gallery, uh, the PowerShell gallery using install module. Um, and all of the demos that we're doing today use this new Burnt Toast notification function. There are more advanced um, scenarios when using Toast notifications via Burnt Toast that require um, a more expansive set of uh, functions. But in order to try and get through a whole bunch of concepts, I've limited myself to just um, new Burnt Toast notifications and 
things I can feed into that um, rather than have to break out into the um, other stuff. Uh, but we still get into some rather advanced topics. So first one here is um, the default notification. So straight out of the box, you've installed Burnt Toast, you run new Burnt Toast notification, you get that. And hopefully you heard the chime. Um, that's the default Windows um, notification sound. Um, and you get just the standard toast, uh, which we saw on one of the previous slides. Uh, let me dismiss that. So that's all well and good, um, but let's face it, nobody's looking into how to use notifications and then just being happy with that default. You want to start customizing it for yourself. So the first use case where I actually wanted to use Toasts myself was at the end of long running scripts. So say I had a... Um, long process that I was expecting to take hours. I didn't want to leave my console up on the screen, um, but I did want to know when it was finished. So I could put a notification at the end to tell me, hey, you, you that, that thing that you ran at 10 a.m. and now it's after lunch, uh, it's done. So you can go and check the results if you want to. Um, so we've got a little thing like this. We can get the current time, format it into something that will look good on a toast notification. Uh, then on our toast, so I'm using splatting here, um, probably should have a link to docs about that, but in short, hash table, supplied into function, um, these are parameters, so say if I went text, that's the same as supplying text in the hash table. So, I'm providing two text strings an app logo, and I'm specifying my sound as a reminder. When this goes off, pay attention to that sound. It should remind you of a um, meeting reminder from Outlook. Fingers crossed. Now, if I run that, yeah, I heard it anyway. Um, you can see my two lines of text. The first one being that script done piece of text there and you'll notice that it's bold so the order that you provide the text does matter um, they will be you can have up to three pieces of text and they display an order the first one is going to be emboldened and so it looks like a header uh, we can see the time that came through so this finished at 10 21 p.m apparently um, i'm up a little bit late doing this um, and my app logo is a image that I've uh, referenced from the internet. Now, when you reference images from the internet, behind the scenes, Burnt Toast is downloading this into your um, temporary files, and it will keep referencing that downloaded copy. Um, so if you do provide a large image, um, you only need to uh, worry about downloading it once, and then from then on, it'll be nice and quick um, to display that toast. So on this topic of sounds, before we move on, there is a predefined list of sounds you can choose from. Um, you'll see a total of 10 alarm sounds, and we're about to hear one of those in the next demo. There's 10 call sounds. And then there's default IM mail reminder SMS. So reminders that Outlook event reminder or meeting reminder. Mail is <laughs> the Outlook new mail. Um, and the other ones probably sound familiar as well. Uh, but these are your options as far as sounds concerned. Um, you can also make them silent. You used to be able to provide custom sounds where you could supply an MP3 or a WAV file. Unfortunately, that broke in some version of Windows and um, there's no fix. <coughs> Uh, on the horizon for that, unfortunately. So, next is alarms. Um, this time, so two pieces of text again. Remembering that first one is going to show up like a header. This time, my app logo was a GIF. Um, so, anywhere... 
I believe anywhere that you can provide a image within your toast notifications, you can actually provide a GIF, which can um, lead to really funny and really annoying toast notifications, depending on how you use it. Uh, this time I'm providing an alarm and I'll point out something once or after it's played. And also this time I'm specifying snooze and dismiss. So this tells Windows to treat it like, well, like an alarm, where you can dismiss the toast by clicking a button, or you can snooze it for a given amount of time. So we'll have a look at that. So I'll, hopefully I can talk over the, the sound. Um, you can see that the uh, app logo is animated, it's little blinking alarm clock. Um, we've got our text there again, but now down the bottom we've got a suite of uh, buttons and selection box items. I really don't know why the default value is 9 minutes. Um, that's, that's been odd. Um, but you can see it goes from 9 through to 1 days. Uh, if you snooze, it'll come back up in that time, and let's get rid of that, because it's driving me nuts. Um, yeah, so I don't know why the default time there's 9 minutes. That's all system generated, and I can't control it within Burnt Toast. Um, it's been on my issues list for ages, and I keep checking every time a new version of Windows is out. Um... It's just one of those things. Uh, now one thing to notice about that alarm sound is it kept looping. Um, when you dive into the more advanced um, component functions um, behind the scenes, you can choose to loop any sound so you can keep dinging that new mail reminder um, or notification sound if you want. You can also choose not to repeat alarm and call sounds. So what I've done behind the scenes is if you specify an alarm or a call, I automatically turn on looping. And I also automatically turn on um, keeping the uh, notification on screen for longer. Um, so you can control that um, yourself. It's just a bit beyond this. Um, just know if you do pick a call or an alarm, it'll loop automatically. If you pick anything else, it won't. Now, snooze and dismiss, those are system generated buttons. What if you wanted to create your own button? So we're still using new burnt toast notification, but we need to call upon another function from the burnt toast module. Um, and that's new BT button. So this creates a button object that we can then um, provide into the toast and all that um, BT button does is it's an object that allows me or allows anyone <laughs> to create a properly formed XML element that represents a button and then by providing that into the rest of the burnt toast functions um, it slots into the right place in the XML. With this one um, we're creating a new button uh, the content is Google, so the content is the text that displays on the button. And the arguments is what runs when the button is clicked. Um, so in this situation, the default behavior is called a protocol activation. Basically what that means is this is going to be activated. If it's a website like this, it's going to open in your default browser. If it's a file, it's going to open up in the default application for that file type. So say if it's a PDF, it might open in Adobe Acrobat. If it's a Excel spreadsheet, it'll open in Excel. Um, a picture might open up in the Photos app or Paint.net or something like that. Um, so where I use this a lot is if those long running scripts happen to generate a CSV file, I'll link my CSV file through a button so that I can just click the button, bring up the CSV file without me having to remember where I was saving it. In this case, it's just opening up Google. Um, 
and the text is a bit tongue in cheek. There's something new on the internet. Uh, sound at this time is I am, and this time I'm providing button. Um, just one button. You can provide multiple, and I don't remember what the maximum is. Um, I'm fairly certain it'll tell you <laughs> if you provide too many. Um, I'm not going to test it though. <laughs> uh, so if we run this, there's the IM sound. Um, there's something new on the internet um, with a nice big button and the button in the last few versions of um, Windows now spans the entire width of the notification. It used to be a standard size and it would be right aligned and it looked kind of ugly to be frank. Um, so one button spans the whole length. If I click it, it opens my browser and Visual Studio, uh, VS Code takes over the focus. But I can pull it back up and there it is. So, that's one button. But what if we wanted multiple buttons? Um, so in this one, we now have two buttons. Google button and a Bing button. And my text has been expanded a bit to say, um, choose your favorite search engine. And you can see that I'm passing in my two buttons. Again, the order here matters just like your text. So the button you provide first is going to show on the left hand side, um, followed by subsequent buttons. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is I've got my content. Cool, we know that's the text that shows on the button. I've got an argument. We know that's uh, the resource that the button's going to open. There's also this image URI. So what we can do with our buttons is choose a picture to show on the uh, on the button itself, just to um, pretty things up a bit. Um, so use cases for this is things like having a yes, no, or confirm, you know, button. We've got ticks and crosses and stuff like that. Um, you do want to choose images that are natively small if you can, um, because they do sh shrink quite dramatically. Um, and bigger images don't tend to look too good when they're shrunk like that. The other thing is keep it a square. Um, if it's wide, Windows is going to shrink it into a square and it's going to look ugly. The other thing to be aware of, depending on um, when I get the patch pushed out, at the moment, if you're doing this at home, your button icons have to be local files uh, online resources like this won't work for you um, they work for me because i found the issue when writing these demos um, patched it myself but it's not been pushed out to the gallery at the time of uh, running these demos through so let's run all of that and this time we can see our notification again, this time with two lines of text um, and two buttons. Uh, so one thing you'll notice is when you're showing the images, it's not as easy to tell where the buttons start and where the toast ends. Um, so you'll remember it was a different grey on my previous toast. This time, same grey until you mouse over it, which I'm not a fan of. It's they don't necessarily look like buttons, but uh, <laughs> this is what we've got to work with. So now if I choose Bing, Chrome opens, VS Code takes over focus again, but there's Bing. So if that was any other website, I could go, um, for example, I could have something that's watching uh, Stack Overflow for new PowerShell questions, and when one pops up, I can get a notification saying, hey, there's a new PowerShell question on uh, Stack Overflow. Um, I can click the button and go straight to that question so I can read it and um, snipe an answer on it or something. Um, <clears throat> so buttons are really handy. Uh, we're going to see events later on, which um, I'm only just starting to really explore what new 
use cases are opened up for buttons when you layer events on top of that. Um, but it's an exciting time ahead. Uh, so, progress bars. These are great for showing, um, well, progress to a user. So, say you're working through a bunch of users in Active Directory. Um, so you've got a couple of thousand users and you need to update their um, their UPNs, their user, princi uh, user principle names. It has been so long since I've worked on AD. <laughs> but say you've got a few thousand users and you're doing something to all of them. Um, what you could do with your toast is show how far through that list of a thousand users you're on. Um, and then you you can um, update that uh, progress bar over time to show um, status check-ins at given intervals. This example here though is a little bit different and I forget who um, sent through the original example showing this but they actually had a script that would poll their um, network printers and then show a toast notification if um, certain toners on the printer were getting too low. Um, and it was a really good um, example, but it also happens to be a good example of how you can stack multiple progress bars on one toast. Um, so I've ripped out all of the bits about getting information because unfortunately I don't have a printer that I can query. Um, although I'm sure if I did, the toner would be low because when isn't it? Um, but in this case, we have the name of a printer. Um, this would most likely be dynamic. You'd probably be checking multiple printers. Um, and then we've got four progress bars using the new BT progress bar function. Within that, we've got a status and a value. So the value is a percentage from zero to one. And the status is just um, information about, if this was a standard progress bar, information about the current status of whatever thing you're reporting progress on. Um, so on that user example, you might say, currently working on Josh, currently working on Kevin, currently working on Sally, etc. Um, here we're using the status to show... Um, which color toner we're reporting. On these, there's also title. So status shows under the progress bar, and I'll point that out once it shows, and title shows above it. So your title could be, say, um, cleaning Active Directory, and then the status could be what you're actually doing in Active Directory at that point. Then there's also value display, which is just a string value. What this allows you to do is overwrite the percentage value. So by default, the value is going to show is, say with point zero, uh, 0 0.75, it'll show as 75%. What you could do is overwrite that to say uh, 750 of 1000 users. So if you wanted something that meant more in the context of what you were doing, you could overwrite that percentage display. So we're not going to do that. So again, we're providing text and we're dynamically um, getting the name of our printer to say, hey, it's low on toner. And then the second line is one, at least one color <laughs> is 10% remaining or less. Choosing a call to sound, because this is kind of important, I need to know that I need to go and replace that toner, or order one, or get someone else to go and replace that toner. And then, again, progress bars can provide multiple of them. I believe four might be the max, possibly five. Um, but then the order you provide them in is the order that they'll show from top to bottom in your notification. So, we run that. We get the um, repeating call sound. Um, and then we can see cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And black being 9% at the moment. 
Um, now this is static, it's not going to update. Um, updating progress bars are a little bit uh, of an art. Um, I'm going to show you the groundwork in a sec for how you can update toasts in general, but progress bars are a bit of a special breed that we can, um, that are a bit beyond today. So, on the topic of updating toasts, you've got two options. The first one is replacing a toast. Um, so here, I've got text on my toast. I'm also layering in now a unique identifier. So the unique identifier is obviously an ID that's unique to a toast. If you send through a new toast with the same unique identifier as a previous one, the previous toast is ripped from existence in Windows and the new one is displayed. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'll show a toast and then what this is doing is I'm just editing the second line of text from my splat hash table, which means I still have my header, I still have my unique identifier, I'm just changing this line, and then I'll change that, display a new toast, change it a third time, and display the new toast. So if I show the first one, we get demo replacement, first example. If I change this while it's on screen, You'll notice it disappears, new one pops up, it's kind of a weird animation. Now if I let that drop off screen, and I do my third example, you can see I get the notification pop up on screen there. Um, so this is great, regardless of what happened to those previous toasts, the user's always going to be notified about the new information. So if the user dismissed the toast, doesn't matter they're going to get the new one with the updated information um, so using this method you don't have to worry at all about anything in user land um, you can just keep firing those through it isn't too great for rapid updates though um, so if I fire through my first one then my second one then my third one then I keep going not good <laughs> so what we can do instead instead of replacing is we can update now this gets a little bit into some actually of all the um, demos today this is probably the most advanced one so by default toasts use a thing called data bindings they're effectively placeholders within that XML. And then in the metadata for your toast, there's a uh, collection of placeholders and the text to slot into those placeholders. Behind the scenes, if you don't provide placeholders with Burnt Toast, I just say, all right, placeholder, text, same thing. Um, no one needs to worry. We can, however, use those um, placeholders to update our toasts. That's not the only use for them, though. You can use it for localization, so you can have multiple languages supported, and then you just swap out um, what maps to your um, placeholders based on, say, the uh, culture settings on the target PC. Um, so to demo this, I've got another unique ID. Uh, this time I've specified it in an ID uh, in a variable so that I can reference it in multiple places. And then I've got this data binding hash table. Um, so I've specifically called these heading placeholder and text placeholder. These can literally be anything as long as they match within the um, toast notification itself. Um, and that's also how the... Um, so say if I had progress value here, I could then put progress value in a progress bar and that's sort of how you update progress bars. Um, so these can be anything, they just have to match. So you can see I've got heading placeholder, heading placeholder, text placeholder, text placeholder. Um, so instead of 
passing through exactly what I want my messages to be in my text for the uh, notification, I instead just put the placeholders. And that's the magic for how we update them. So before I run that first toast, I'm going to show you how the how we update it because um, I want to do it while it's on screen and I don't have a lot of time to talk through the <laughs> talk through the change. So what I'm doing here is I just I'm in this case just changing my text placeholder. I could change both. I could change just one, which is what I'm doing here. Um, I can't add new ones. So if I had a third piece of text here saying this is static, if it's not in my original data binding, it won't be updatable. So just keep that in mind. Um, so what I'm doing is changing my text placeholder to a new value. So I'm going from this is the first example to this is the second example. Um, and then I'm updating it using a new function called update BT notification. Uh, specifying my unique identifier and my data binding. So let me call my first toast. And while it's still on screen, I'll update it. So you would have seen there it changed from first example to second example. It also got bigger, which is interesting. Um, the other thing is when you update a notification, if it's still on screen, it resets the timer for it timing out and dismissing off screen, which is um, actually a fairly convenient way of keeping something on screen. You just keep updating it every second or two. Um, and because it's updating and not replacing, it's seamless. Um, yeah. Now, with that off screen, let me go and update it a third time. I just saw an error fly past. Oh, that's another one of those fixes that I've got patched somewhere and not deployed to the gallery yet. So you can safely ignore that it worked. <laughs> but what you will have noticed is when I updated that, nothing happened. No toast notification came up. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to show the action center. Um, but it did update in there. And if I go and rapidly update things, show the first one, show the second one, show the third one, all updated. Now, you'll notice in my console here it says succeeded when it has succeeded in updating the toast. If I run the first one again and I go and click it, that toast notification is now gone. It doesn't exist on my system anymore. If I try and update it, I get notification not found. So that's the thing about this update procedure as opposed to replace, is you can only update what exists. If the user's gotten rid of the toast, you can't update it because there's nothing there. There are ways of checking if a notification exists um, using get BT history, um, but that's a little bit too involved for today. Uh, and I believe we're running out of time, so I better hurry along. So I mentioned events. This is brand new stuff and it is really exciting. And I'm afraid the next two demos aren't going to do it justice, but I've been working on this or trying to get this going for the last four or five years. We finally cracked it in the last month or two um, and it just unlocks all the potential of toast notifications. Effectively with events, when you click a toast or click a button or select an item from a selection box or enter text into a text box, which are all things you can do with hosts, you can trigger an event within PowerShell. Um, so this example is really simple. I've got two script blocks here. One just writes a warning saying activated. The other just writes a warning saying dismissed. And I'm passing these into new burnt toast notification using activated action and dismissed action. So let's have a look at that. So I've got my toast. If I click it, 
I get a warning saying activated. So clicking the toast, clicking buttons on the toast, those are all activated events. If instead I run that and click this little uh, arrow to send it into my action center, I get dismissed. And again, if I show the toast and just wait for it to time out, I also get dismissed. So now that allows me to take different actions based on how the user interacted with my notification, what, and when you dive even further into them, um, you can uh, take branching paths based on stuff. You can take input from the user with an input box or a selection item. Oh, I could talk forever about those, but I've only got a minute or two left. <laughs> So for my final demo, we're going to take advantage of being able to tell how a toast was dismissed. So my first toast just displays text, hey, this is important, and then it's got a dismissed action. That dismissed script block that it's referencing finds out the reason for why it was dismissed, and I want it to and I want to only trigger this follow-up action if it was timed out. That's important because this has the potential of snowballing and causing a headache, <laughs> as I found out when I was writing the demo. Um, so if it did time out, we're going to say, hey, don't ignore me. And then if you ignore it, it's going to call itself again. Uh, which you can imagine is going to be a little bit painful. So I'm just going to run this and let it go for a bit. So we get our toast. This is important. It dismisses and hands off the keyboard. Hey, don't ignore me. And then that one dismisses. Hey, don't ignore me. And that's going to keep going forever until it pops up and I dismiss it. So because I dismissed it via user action rather than timing out, it now doesn't send through a new notification. I could have also clicked it to activate it. Um, the reason why I went this route, the timed out route, is because when they time out, they go to the action center. When you clear them out from the action center, that's another dismissed event. <laughs> Which means if you've had 10 of them and you clear the action center, guess what? you're about to get 10 more notifications that care if they've been dismissed again. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> so, wrapping up. Takeaways from today. Toast notifications are all XML behind the scenes. So if you want to, you can dive in. Um, you can... Um, <sighs> go that route, um, but luckily you don't need to touch XML. Um, there are a number of options out there for avoiding that, obviously Burnt Toast. Behind the scenes, Burnt Toast uses the what used to be the UWP Community Toolkit, now the Windows Community Toolkit, um, and you can use that yourself in your own projects if you want to. Or you can use Burnt Toast. Um, feel free to rip Burnt Toast apart, repurpose it, use it wholesale, you know, do whatever. Um, and one thing I'm really keen on is hearing your use cases. Um, either how you're using it, how you want to use it, what's stopping you from using it. Um, I love all of that stuff. So thank you for coming to this session. I believe if I'm remembering the session um, schedule properly, I'm the second session of the day. Um, and it was a priv privilege to be here and talk to you today. Um, make sure you thank all of the, I guess that way, that way. I'm not sure which way around my web camera is going to be pointing. Make sure you follow all the people involved in helping organize today. Um, I've got the at tags down there, follow the event hashtag. This uh, presentation and the demo code are all going to be up on my GitHub. And you can get to that via toast.click slash talks. Um, and thanks again. <laughs>